Este contenido es financiado con recursos del Fondo Único de Ti. How you guys doing? It's good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, How are you guys doing? Yeah, we're just, you know, kicking it and, you know, waiting for this very special moment to get to know you and see how you've been. Saw you guys were in Amsterdam. How was it? Amsterdam was lovely, actually. It was great. Yeah, it was all good. Paris was good. Lisbon was good. Berlin was good. Berlin was good. London was good. Okay, so you guys have been around for for yeah, quite a while this year. Doing a little bit of press. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Was this the very first time you got out of LA after the whole pandemic gig? No, I've been go well, go I've been going to London. But I had multiple problems aside from the pandemic. What happened? I broke both my feet, shattered, oh, shattered my heels, and I had to have like pins and plates put in them. So I was kind of couldn't walk for six months. How? How did you break your feet? I jumped off a wall with no shoes on. On oh, his birthday? On my birthday. Yeah. It wasn't a Jonathan thing. <laughs> OK. I know. Can you believe that? It was actually a very kind, generous thing. What was it? I mean, why did you have um, to because jump? Because my dog, I, 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 was going, I, I was going to bed and I heard my dog, what sounded like my dog being attacked by, uh, I thought it was coyotes, because I get coyotes up there in my house. So I just ran out. It was like a, just a knee-jerk reaction. I just ran out and jumped off this big wall down some stairs, concrete steps, and just shattered my heels. It wasn't coyotes in the end. It was a skunk. OK. How long did it take you to recover? Six months. So I mean, I, I started walking at like six months. I was in a wheelchair for four months, but like, and then I started walking after that, but I couldn't really walk for a while. It was like. It's an amazing feeling when you when you haven't used your feet and your legs for a while. It's so uncomfortable, so painful. I don't know how people do it. Walk? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> no, because a lot of it a lot of it is really you just get used to how uncomfortable walking is. Right, and you, you don't feel it anymore. You don't, it's not it's not you don't your brain doesn't receive it as pain, but it's really painful. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it. You have your whole body weight on two little tiny flat things at the bottom of your body. Supporting everything. It's kind of a weird concept, walking. Let's really dive into that. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you, Jamie? How old am I? Yeah. 54. All right. Okay. How old are you? I'm 48. Getting there. Yeah. <laughs> How are the years treating you? You guys happy? Yeah, I mean, we're very excited about this record. We feel like we've been through a lot in the last seven years, you know? I, we had a really wonderful time with Asha Nice and touring the world for three years. And then, like everybody else on the planet, went through the pandemic, which was, you know, not that much fun. And I'm very, very proud that we were able to put it together a record that we're so in love with and to get to go out on the road again. What was the hardest part of being locked down? I think just me, uh, for me, it was just the, the physicality of not going some other places. You know, I really, I've been basically on tour since I was 14 years old, so that's 30 years. And I, I know. I'm not used to being anywhere longer than about two weeks, three weeks. So that's pretty my, much my max out point, or at least it was before the pandemic. Now I'm like pretty good for a month, month and a half. I'm, I'm cool. <laughs> but before that, it wasn't like that, you know, so it was really, I had very itchy. Um, that was the hardest thing for me, I think. Did you guys stop seeing each other during that time? No, because I couldn't stay home. I started driving back and forth across the country to come see him. <laughs> mm. yeah. I saw an interview of you guys before this whole thing started, and I guess, you know, you have to talk about it because there were so many songs that were almost ready to go out into the world before the whole thing just, you know, collapsed. And uh, you were pretty desperate too, you know, like in some of the interviews that you guys were doing on Zoom, you're already fed up with the whole situation. I saw a couple of Maybe interviews. I've met, I've remembered it differently, but I felt like I had a sort of manic episode for two years. It just kind of, I, I quite enjoyed it, but it, was, it's, it wasn't without its frustrations. I mean, the, the downside is always 
the dangers of being able to do exactly what you want when you, I was living like a cat you know I didn't I didn't go to bed at any time I just sort of like l had a little sleep when I was tired and then I'd be up again but at like night and day nothing there was no there was just no regiment no discipline at all I'd just have a little cat nap for a bit sometimes I was <laughs> up at four o'clock in the morning till 10 in the morning and then I'd sleep sometimes I was you know and it takes its toll after a while. Did the songs that you were working on make it into this album? Are they a part of this album? Or that was, was the pandemic just like a big catalyzer for working on new stuff and making God Games happen? Uh, I think there's only one song. We were just talking about this in the last... That, there's only one song that we wrote before the pandemic that made it Bullet to the sound. other side of the pandemic. Bullet sound made it from one side to the other. Yeah. But uh, there was a lot of songs that were just... I mean, it wasn't really a, anything to do with the pandemic. We were just starting. Um, Alison's process is to write a lot of things, you know, like... And, you know, just give me all of them. And there was just... They, they, they're always good but it's not you have to have that thing where something jumps out and you're like oh my god you know and it, we, yeah. we weren't really feeling that and same with the stuff i was doing we just weren't really feeling anything apart from bullet sound and then after that i don't know whether it was we, because we were closer to mortality <laughs> it just felt like so much more urgent and so much more important to make everything had to be absolutely go, go through a sort of filter of the standard was really high you know was there anything that you, you you mentioned or at least i was reading as i was listening to the album on the domino record page that you're an atheist but um is there anything that you believe in when it comes to the music that you made for this album well, beliefs of you know <laughs> you talk about belief in supernatural things that right. don't exist that's one thing obviously i believe in a lot of things um i believe in the power of music if you want to be hippie yeah. about it there's no doubt about that sometimes i don't feel like i have to decide what i really believe in or, or decide or, or define it or have it make sense sometimes i think about ghosts and i just think i shouldn't you know do i really believe in ghosts because if i don't believe in the afterlife that shouldn't exist but i just don't really care when i pick up a, my guitar from like 1921 and i play some stuff on it i kind of it makes me believe in ghosts there's something in that <laughs> shit there's something going on in there you know yeah yeah it's energy. There's like energy and stuff. Vibrations. You know? Vibrations, man. Vibrations. In LA. <laughs> There's vibrations everywhere, actually, not just fucking LA. <laughs> I know. Don't let those like, fools hijack it. It's vibrations and food here. There are high vibrations. <laughs> Tell me about the story of New York and how that sure. song came about. So after, well, it was still kind of the pandemic, but everyone was traveling and everyone was vaccinated and it was kind of a different time, right? It was a couple of years later and are you, I mean, I know that you, you tell us. so much higher I, than you. Really I need, need a booster cushion. <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> um, Sorry. I went to New York during the summer in 2021 and had the most incredible, like 10 days there. For one, New York during the pandemic was the one place in America which I had my eye on the entire time because it was an absolute shit show with COVID. You know, it was kind of the, the epicenter for this country at that time. And so all the news was kind of coming through there, everything. And, um, and New York also happens to be my favorite city in the world. So it was the one place that I missed the most the entire time. I just wanted to go back. So it was glorious. It was an amazing thing to finally get to go to New York and walk down the streets and see my friends. And um, and that song was inspired by just the, the happiness and the joy and that I feel there and how inspiring it is. And um, it's a love song to the city. It's a love song itself. It's just like every time I've gone to New York in my life, I always come back like full. I'm just full and I'm ready to make something. And so I came home and wrote that song. What is it about New York? What is it about New York? We're not allowed to really know. Otherwise, the magic will go away. 
what did Crashing a Wedding have to do with writing that song? I don't know if Crashing a Wedding had to do with writing that song, but Crashing a Wedding is not something I would normally do, and that's the kind of thing I would do in New York. So this is what I mean, you know? There's just like funny things that happen. You don't have to make plans there. You just walk down the street and suddenly you're going to a wedding and suddenly you meet somebody, this happens, you run into an old friend, you're now like you've been dragged to the theater, you're going to see this art thing. Like you don't have to, you just, all you have to do there is just get out of bed and walk outside. And then the whole day will happen. And that was one of those things. It's a perfect example of what I mean. Yeah. What about L.A. Hicks? Um, <clears throat> what about it? Tell me the story. <laughs> Isn't it about a city, too? Um, it's about L.A. <laughs> um, it was actually quite... I, I was on a street... Because it's contrast. It's, it's a bit of a contrast, isn't it? I mean, when you hear the stories... You mean between New York, New York and yeah, L.A. and maybe. how it came about? That's totally accidental, though. We weren't trying to just write an East Coast, West Coast Well, vibe. Alison had a love experience in New York. I, this, I, my L.A. Hex song was not about a love experience. A um, few of my songs are about love experiences. What? The aftermath of love experiences, perhaps. <laughs> but um, L.A. I was standing on a corner, and I just loved the sound. The sound of L.A. It was like cars passing with you know, hip hop going in one car, like, boom, 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 like loads of sub bass and then a kind of gospel choir going the other way and a mariachi band and just all this cacophony of cars with music blasting. And, and I just wanted to make a song like that. Um, and I liked the idea of, I didn't like the idea. The, it just struck me that everyone was in little capsules in, in, in their cars in LA and they've all got these little lives going on. And it was a... It was a culture clash. It's yeah, really it was cool. just writing about the, the... There's some kind of black magic here, something weird going on. And whether it's good or whether it's bad, it doesn't matter. I think we always try, and try to put things in categories of whether it's nice or good or fun or positive or negative. And it doesn't matter to me. It's just something. And um, that was what that song was, was about, the chaos and the cacophony of, and the hypocrisy and everything that is the wonderfully beautiful L.A. Yeah. I'm curious and captivated by how your relationship has turned into one of the most successful musical careers of rock and roll in a time where rock and roll seems to be uh, going through uh, popularity crisis, if you will. And I would like to very naively ask how you guys got together and how your relationship and your friendship and your musical partnership came about. Well, we met uh, in like 1997 or 98. 99. That's the first time we met? I think so. Mm -mm. I've been coming over there a lot before well, that. Maybe, yeah. Maybe going more. to London. Yeah. I was in a band called Discount, and we toured in England a lot. And um, he lived in a house in South London that also had two other people in it. One of the other people drove the van that I was touring in, and the other guy booked the tours. And he was part of a record label with one of the guys that put a seven-inch out of mine. And so I was just hanging around there, and... Um, we met that way. I, I was sleeping on the, the ground floor and I could hear this crazy guitar playing coming through the ceiling. And it was the coolest sound I'd ever heard. <laughs> and I didn't know who that was. And that was that guy. <laughs> Then this like really cool looking guy with like crazy style comes downstairs to make some toast and some coffee and hang out. And it was, it was Mr. Jamie Hintz. I don't, I, I, this crazy star thing, I've heard this before, do you remember like? You had really crazy style. Someone, else, <laughs> someone said like, um, we recorded, we did a load of recording at Benton Harbor, this, this studio called Key Club. And uh, the guy that was running it, he said, run, running it, he said, I ran into this guy and he said, yeah, I think I know that, that Jamie guy. He's got, he's kind of really weird. He's, he was wearing three pairs of goggles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, exactly. I, thought, I did have that phase, didn't I? Yeah. Because we were recording, and I, it wasn't a fashion thing. It was like, I just felt, look, I wanted to have these blinkers on, so I'd put all these goggles over so I couldn't see. And then when I was playing, it was fucking amazing. And I was like, I would drum with, like, three pairs of goggles. Like, just so, <laughs> and just so I was, like, lost in, like, what do you call those? Those kind of, um, you know, sensory 
pingy chambers. Yeah. Felt like that. Anyway. You were like... Over to you, back to what my style was. Anyway, great. yeah, he was, yeah, <laughs> wild looking and really funny. And so that's how we met, basically. We, we started to become friends and talk and hang out and he would play me records and we would talk about books and we would talk about music and mostly he would talk and I would just laugh. Mm. And... No, he's changed. No, my shit's changed. <laughs> and, um... And then I was going on a tour in Europe with my band and he lent me a four-track cassette recorder to take with me and he encouraged me to write songs. He's like, you weren't writing at I that time? I wrote lyrics. I was in a four-piece band. I was a singer, so they wrote the music and I wrote the lyrics and that's how we operated, which is kind of pretty normal, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I was doing, but he really encouraged me to write my own things. And so I took that away and I just felt like it was the, the best it was the best task anybody could set for me. You know, it was so much she fun. She brought it back and I played these things and I was so jealous. It was just like, it wasn't songs. It was just this amazing kind of sound collage things that really cool. I mean, we're just really fucking cool. It just like chopped up drums with some like radio stuff and then her speaking over the top and it was just really she just had a natural, it was talented, really, really talented, just un absolutely unhinged, but <laughs> talented. Which is just like three goggles, but put to music. <laughs> three, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your first memory of Alison? Uh, well, it was in a pub called the Paxton. I lived in a little squat in Gypsy Hill, and um, I, I was sitting in there, and she, she walked in with her band, and that was it. That was my foot, and I said hello, and she just went bright red and didn't say anything back. <laughs> <laughs> when did you decide to become the Kills? Well, there was a kind of moment, but before that we were kind of sending, because he inspired me with this four-track thing. So I bought a four-track in Florida, and we were just like send tapes back and forth and add things to each other's tapes, and we kind of did that for half a year or something. And then I went back to London and he picked me up from the airport and I think it was that so when we decided that we were going to be a band and turn our lives into a band and our band into our lives and we were going to basically be like an art duo, you know, there was not, there's not rules, there's not like, you know, if, if film is part of it or painting is part of it or, you know, books are part of it or what, whatever the art form is, this is all like, this is all possible. You know, we can make anything we want, any kind of music, whatever. So it was really exciting and it was kind of, we made a pact on that car ride back to Gypsy Hill. And that was it. 23 years really, later, we didn't we literally become, we, we'd actually recorded our first EP before we literally became the Kills. Mm -hmm. And that was actually the deadline was like, we'd done two shows without a name. And then we finished our EP and we had to write something on the tape box and we basically came up with it the night before because we had to we had to come up with a name so we did that and I remember the first reaction from my the guy that I really looked up to he was like sounds like a metal band <laughs> <laughs> fucking miserable son what was it like back then? You know, you've been around for 20 years and it seems like a flash. You know, it seems yeah. like it just, you know, it still sounds refreshing and new and, and young, but, you know, what has changed? What was it like back then? Well, I think, I don't know. I feel like we, we sort of, we came around at a really cool time when there were a lot of guitar bands. There was a lot of, like stuff that we were really into actually happening and now we've been through lots of phases in music where that maybe we're playing festivals and we don't know anybody there and that's really a weird thing you know and we don't hear one single electric guitar all day but for some reason we're on this e fest you know what i mean there's those cycles those things that have happened um i think there was definitely that uh, there was that time there was a time um sort of 20 between 2016 and 2020 where guitar music was really flatlining it was it was dying so it really felt like that mm. but not anymore i think it's really happened again there's so many of the coolest new things that i hear are guitar bands you know like really young kids that's that's the coolest shit you can do is pick up a guitar and play a guitar and i think that's fucking wonderful yeah, yeah. 
It is the coolest thing you can do, let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very interesting to hear it happen as refreshingly as it was the first time on this new album, you know, on God Thank Games. You. you really hear guitar power, but you hear a whole bunch of other stuff, you know. It's not just, yeah, of course, the guitars are essential, but... I think you it's know, important for you know rock and roll music to evolve. It's like he's talk. He talks about it all the time. That rock and roll production is not very progressive. It's not very forward thinking. It's not very modern. It's like quite retrospective, you know. Sort of traditional, maybe. Yeah, yeah and then you know, like hip hop and pop and R and B and all of that is like really forward thinking. Always kind of reinventing. Always um, pushing the envelope, you know. And and we've always been fascinated with that, with trying to make something that is. Um, and maybe not for our first couple of records, but in my head, I've always been trying to do that. Is trying to make a kind of new, a new horizon. It for, sounds like for it for electric guitar music. It know? definitely sounds like it. But back then, first two records were there influences well, or things you were looking I mean, into. The first record, I just wanted to be Velvet Underground, and, and the second record, I wanted to be Suicide and Cabaret Voltaire. Cool. <laughs> that, that, so I think those are the those, those you become more you're more referential when you're younger you know you kind of want to sound like the things you love and then as you get older you understand the things that you love and you understand that sounding like them is not what not is is destroying it you know so I want to take influences that and ah, you know I've I've lost track of the question yeah, well, we were talking about uh, innovation, uh, freshness, mm. and uh, how new this record sounds. Because, and, and then I asked you about yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the first couple of records, but then coming back to God Games does sound like sometimes as a listener, if you're a fan of music, uh, you will have to give God Games more listens than expected, you know, because there's not much to uh, find yourself in terms of references, you know, you... you I'm you, happy with that. Yeah. yeah. It's really, it's a daunting listen, you know, it's not something that you approach and say, oh, I heard that. Right. Uh, you and know, you felt, felt that. It's really before. nice that it's not familiar. It isn't. But at the same time, once you hear it, Three or four times, it grows on you. It starts growing on you. you. This is our, you know, this is the phase we're in. You know, making futuristic, experimental, <laughs> groundbreaking music. <laughs> With the next albums, it's going to be all hits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just wait, guys. It's a journey. <laughs> Quite a journey it is, and. Uh, you you worked with Paul Epworth on this record, yeah. and I was gonna ask you right after you talked about the beginning when we were talking about the beginning because he was a part of the beginning as well of the Kills, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me more about he was our first with him. sound man, literally our first sound man, literally. Yeah, yeah, it was literally our first sound man. The yeah. first, I mean, on our very first tour, we didn't have a sound man because we were that. That's how embryonic it was, but. The fir our first paid sound man was Paul Epworth. Thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> Adele. <laughs> it wasn't for us. <laughs> Had you been in contact with him over the course of these years? Uh, not for a while. I mean, we'd, like, we would check in sometimes, or, I'd, or I'd, I'd get a text from him sometimes, like, oh, I ran into blah, 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 but no, we weren't really in contact. We hadn't, we hadn't been for a little while. Um, but I mean, the conversation we, when we decided that it was a smart idea, maybe maybe it would work with Paul. We um, the conversation was like seconds long. He was like, "Yeah, definitely." It wasn't even it wasn't even a yes or no, was it? It was just like, "When should we start?" Yeah, you know. And uh, we'd sent him demos, and he loved. He said, "Like, look, it was a perfect project for him." Why? Uh, because I think if he'd if he'd if he'd um, had to start from scratch, you know, with no songs, which is kind of often what we do when we go in the studio. It would have been a much more of a weird headache and not knowing where it was going to go. But the record was written. It was pretty. He said he said himself, you know, 
you don't need a producer, it's already produced, which just was just wonderful to hear because it meant that he could be this overseer that just kind of like told us when things were done and got really great performances out of us. That was the, that's what we kept saying. We said, look, we've got the foundation, but we want to go into a studio and do, a, you know, perform it. Like have this raw adrenaline filled performance over the top and what better person to do it with than someone that's, you know, made multi-platinum records. <laughs> How, did it work that way entirely or were there parts where you had to just stop and go back to the drawing board and rethink some of the songs? No, I mean, this, no. Is, this was like five, you know, five-eighths of the way through. So, you know, we'd already, like, Paul was brought in at the very last stage. So all that stuff we'd already overcome. We'd already made, we'd already had those kind of fears and meltdowns and tantrums and elation and euphoria. You know, we'd already had all that. There was no kind of, um, there wasn't any points like that in the studio particularly, were there? I had a bit of a meltdown about, because I hadn't put any guitar on anything and I'd kept promising that I would come in with some guitar and I just kind of hadn't got anything. That was a little bit of a worry, but boy, did it. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What, what was your process working on this album? Tell me about it. Um, well, what, what part of it? In the studio or? You, you know, the songwriting, maybe? If you could share um, with I me. I started, Jamie suggested that I get this little keyboard to write on. He's just like, just mess around with it and see what happens. Kind of like that day he gave me that four track to take away. And I just, I loved it. I kind of dove right in and just started writing songs, so many songs. And I loved what the keyboard did because it just like changed the rhythm of everything. So I don't know how to play piano. So it was kind of very rudimentary and it was very freeing. Um, and I could come up with melodies that I was so fascinated by and I could come up with different rhythms to sing things. and. It was great. So I think my songwriting was, you know, the process of writing was completely different for me on this record. Normally I would just write on an acoustic guitar or something. That would be like the foundation. And then that goes away and then, you know. Um, but yeah, that was brilliant. And then in the studio, I mean, it was a really nice thing to go into the studio with everything done. When I said it the whole time we were in there, I was like, Jamie, this feels so much like making our first record. Because mm. I think the very last time we went into a studio with everything written and done was Keep On Your Mean Side. It might have happened for no while. It might have. But I feel like we kind of had a few false starts with that. Anyway, regardless, it was such a wonderful feeling to be in the studio and know what you wanted to achieve and not be kind of grasping and looking. Mm. Um, certainly there were creative things to be done in the studio. Plenty. But it was to have the foundation laid and know what the songs are and pretty much how they're gonna go and what you want to hear out of them was a really fun thing to do, you know? It's really enjoyable to be in a studio for me at that point. And then working with Paul was great. I, you know, I, he'd almost trick me into singing songs because I would go in and I was thinking I was like checking a mic and he'd be like, okay. So we would get, like, get to sing the song like once or twice. And for the most part, that's what you're hearing on the record. Cool. Yeah. It's interesting how when, when, when Jamie invites you to try something new, you, you dive right into it. I'd, I'd be scared always, shitless, man. That's an honest really? like that. I'd be like, like, like play, oh, piano, no, I'm play very, piano. I'm very happy you know, to try anything. Like, yeah. I've done it before. I got a, this uh, thing, like a sequencer with all these pads. It's kind of, uh, it's called that, a you lost me on that one. And I got you. So I gave that nothing. It's in like in the corner, not even in the corner. It's just hidden. Just don't like the look of it. And then the good thing about this Akai keyboard was that it was looked really cool. <laughs> it's got reverse color keys, so all the white keys are black and all the black keys are white. It's pretty dope. And it's really dope. 
that's what got her. Was the look of it. The, the, the look and feel. No, I think I, I, you know. She still has this thing, I which is very, it's a rule like, of music, which is really works a lot. If the thing looks good, it's going to sound. Good. I understand mechanical things like cassettes, right? I understand how that works. I can like my brain is can know, but like as soon as there was like a bunch of pads and things, and I had to do like this computer program, and suddenly I was just like so fluxing yeah, to be that I couldn't with you, be creative. I, agree. It's I fucking, was just like, I don't like it. My brain doesn't like really it. work very well like that. My, you know, I only. I know those things by memory only. Then I, I don't understand the logic. So if I, you know, I can I get really into these things and work can work them like the back of my hand. They <laughs> put them away for a month, uh, and I can't do it. <laughs> and I've got to learn it all again. <laughs> um, tell me about the artwork. What um, about it? Who did it? Well, who did it? It's difficult to say. It's very difficult to it was say. A, it was a painting that was left at my house when I moved in as a gift, and it was above my um, fireplace. And I just, uh, I kind of laughed at it when I saw it because it's not a good, not a very good painting. It's like obviously a sort of a want-to-be painter who hadn't quite got there, and. Um, I just kind of grew, grew to love it because I looked at it every day, especially during the pan pandemic. I was my my kind of sofa area was my creative hub, you know, and this was my your leg uh, casts. This was kind of my altar, yeah, because I, I was like this with my feet because I couldn't move, <laughs> and, uh, and this was my altar, and it was just my, kind of like maybe I just looked at it so much, it seemed like, you know, if your record is going to absorb the time that you live in, well, that was a pretty that was pretty, you know, symbolic of the time that I was in. And I liked the, just how much it conjured up, you know, like there's an you know, obvious metaphor about the human condition in, in a bullfight, you know, the cruelty of it and how, how we are with animals and people and everything emotionally, physically, and how we dress it up in tradition and all this kind of weird sort of ridiculous behavior that we've we've decided is is, is a you know is, is able to excuse a lot of these things and at the same time it's a bad picture and i liked that it was a kind of an artist that was struggling with painting a picture you know it's all it's just there is no statement it's just uh it's designed it's just to, something make, to, think about. to make you think and there's not a code to it or an answer at the end it's all the things you think. If you are against animal cruelty, which I hope everyone is, then you will see that's your reaction. If you're pro bullfighting, that's your reaction. It's like blame yourself. Don't blame the artwork. <laughs> <laughs> but is it? But is it connected to the lyrics? Oh. Because she, it does sound a yeah, bit like. But, well, it seemed to make sense. Like both of us were writing, we had like lots of like bull references and heaven references and God references and all these things that just kept showing up in our lyrics, very unbeknownst to the two of us. You know, it was like he'd play me a song and I'd play him a song and be like, we've used some of the same kind of lyrical, you know, clues, like things to. And it was, so it was interesting. So it, was, it felt really. It yeah, felt I just, I mean, for me, it was just that was that, that verse in God Games, like a matter door that adore you for every heart you tore through. And then whatever the uh, next line is, I can never remember my own lyrics. <laughs> I can never remember. And like every matter door before you, they're praying for the bulls to gore you. That's a simple, it's a simple concept to grasp. The, and it's, it's a simple metaphor, you know. It's obviously not literal. It's a metaphor for like, you know, you can do all these things that you get accepted for, cruel, brutal things, some might say, that you'll be accepted into the crowd. But at the end of the day, everyone's really hoping you're going to get fucked over. <laughs> As humans. Yeah. Right. I really like the artwork. I like it too. But we couldn't actually use, I love it. We couldn't use my original painting. Because we could. So what you so we had my friend Rachel repaint it. We had, really? Yeah. Which was uh, which we I loved that idea. I was kind of angry that we couldn't use it, but then I liked this idea. It just seemed like I said, you know, absorbing, and uh, you know, you want your record to be, you know, now in the in a kind of representation of what's going on now, and it seemed like another layer of it was that we, you know, copy. Oh shit. <laughs> 
seeing like, you know, copyright, you can't use this painting. Litigation, again, is, uh, you know, informs the art you can use. And I sort of just thought that was very... But it's very happening all over the place, you know, like that yeah, whole litigation it, thing. Never had it this bad. It's kind of mad. Like all, you know, you do, you're doing some artwork and it's like, um, I would like to draw your attention to the um, I Apple iPhone in photograph number four. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my fucking God. <laughs> now as that happens. <laughs> I don't know, but I did, I think it's, it's a striking image, you know, and connected to the title of the album. And once, again, once you, start you know swimming deep into the album then it makes a whole lot of sense because it yeah. connects to all your senses you know it's visual it's you know you're hearing things you're sort of just feeling an entire body of work and i think that's you know amazing you know it's that's pretty cool it's it's crazy that you didn't think it was a good painting i actually thought it was pretty technically interesting <laughs> I think it's a pretty good painting. I think the original is pretty good, actually. But the funny thing about it is I'm is pretty sure that the bull has five legs. No, it's his, it. it's, I think it's his, it's his it's penis. It's not his penis. It it's is. a fifth leg that they just... Penis. <laughs> it's a very big... So, competition time. <laughs> is it a leg or is it a penis? <laughs> Answers on a postcard. <laughs> Listen, um... Tell me about the, um, the working on the studio that's a church. Mm. Is, is that where Paul works? Mm. Yeah, that's his studio. It's it, called The Church. It, it is it's a church. It's a church. Oh, church. It used to be Dave Stewart from Eurythmics and then David Gray, um, oh, who was a big, big artist in England. And, and then uh, Paul Epworth took it on after that. Uh, yeah, very famous studio. I think the Travelling Wilburys recorded there. Really? Which, Bob Dylan slept there. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. in, I think in the Wilburys, mm -hmm. which means Roy Orbison sang in there. Oh, my so God! Cool. Can you believe that? <laughs> that really gets me going. Maybe the ghosts of Roy, Roy Orbison. I totally hang out with his ghosts. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I didn't see him when I was there. And Tom but... now. Tom yeah. and Roy together. Yeah. Betty. And Orbis. You saw them? When? The, the, the Traveling Wilburys? No. You ever saw them? No. 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 What about, um, are we ready? Okay. <laughs> okay, um, I had a one last couple questions to ask. Um, you still painting? Yes. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Do you do you showcase your artwork? I haven't done a show since 2019, but I can't wait to do another one. Did, you did, uh, I don't know if you did it for them, but one of Colombia's most important rock bands, Diamante yeah, Electrico, yeah. you yeah. did Buitres cover, They right? used the painting. Well, that was in my Mexico City show, and yeah. they used that painting, and I love that they did. It's so cool. Yeah, they have really great fond memories of you so and You're they send sweet. their regards we've only come we've never played Columbia. i was just gonna ask we that really, really want to. so what are we Can gonna do about this happen? i would very much love to do who that who do we call <laughs> just get some so sort of petition who do i call i mean what what do i have to do who do i have to talk to i'm oh, man. more than willing to i love it i got to go to i got to go to columbia once for a vacation and it was just where'd you most go amazing I went to Cartagena. Okay. I went to um, Medellin. Yeah. Pronouncing Medellin. Medellin. That's it. Yeah. And then what's the big city one? Bogota. 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 Yeah. Okay, cool. Is uh, Andrew Luke Oldham still live there? Yep. Yes. yes. He Listen. interviewed us from there. That's the closest I've ever got to Bogota. He's got a beautiful house in Apulo on the outside of Bogota. I mean, you have to oh go to Bogota. You two coolest. have to go to Bogota and hang out. We're I mean, gonna do it. It's We're gonna definitely do it. a city. I absolutely that's... loved it so much. It was brilliant. I do have a question though. The whole time I was there, I was trying to send a postcard, and no one would sell me stamps. How do you guys send mail? We, I don't think we do anymore. But we do have a postal totally, service. But but where? How do I get to it? <laughs> That's when a great I'm question. There. That's a I great question. Walked, I talked to every hotel, walked around. Every, I was and they like, didn't know. No, they would send me to some sort of place, and I would get to that place, and they would be like, no. 
that that we don't. I, it was like I had to send a package, I could, but I couldn't just like send a postcard. That's interesting because I mean, I guess you know. This is a while ago. I mean, this is probably like seven years ago, but still, I'm still, still? trying to send a postcard in Colombia. So if you've got any tips. Oh, got to play that. It's, st it's still very interesting that you're sending postcards. That, yes. you, that you still send. She does oh, yeah. it whenever she goes away. She still, she still does. She's one of that, you know. I have to send postcards. Last of a dying breed. She's whenever she's away somewhere, I'll get a postcard from her. Uh, every birth, you know, birthday birthday cards. Uh, that's a yeah. dying thing. I don't send them anymore. Christmas cards. She's got a Christmas card list. She sends ca cards Hundreds. out. I enjoy this. Very she much. had a good mother. <laughs> her mother took, brought her up with an iron fist, told her to send right, cards, right, be right, polite. <laughs> My mother, on the other hand. When's the tour starting? You don't want to send We start in February in America. Okay. Um, and then I, the rest, I, I don't know what the order of everything will be, but I really would like to come there. What do you want to do most? Festivals or just, you know, shows, your shows? Um, I, I actually don't mind. Whatever gets us there, I'll take it. You know, festivals okay. are probably usually easier but to But what's do. your preference right now? I love just normal shows. Yeah, normal yeah. shows. It seems like everyone... I prefer. ...is kind of going back into their own thing. Festivals right? got a little bit blown out. I mean, they this do. has all gotten so big. That's what you're talking about, though, because festivals in America are, are, are just kind of not that fulfilling anymore so many rules and stupidity but i think there's some new good there, ones there's a lot festivals in england have got very commercial obviously just doing it for the money festivals in south america have been like a, a completely different kettle of fish you know and i do <laughs> feel like playing like a festival in peru or something or in argentina is kind of maybe preferable for me to play a club show just because you could play to more people and we don't cool. get down there that much, so it's kind of nice. But I definitely would love to see you guys perform on your own. We will make yeah. sure it happens. So good to meet you. So nice to Such meet you. a wonderful album. Thank you very much for Thank giving you. me these Thank you. 40 minutes of your time. God Games is amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Este contenido es financiado con recursos del Fondo Único de Ti.